uh, saving more for most folks means taking more risk. So let's take a look at some of the data that was in that uh, How report. We're going to assume that inflation is 2%. Uh, if you had a stock bond ratio of 50-50, your compound annual growth rate is going to be 2.7% real. That is after inflation has been removed. Uh, and then you see 75% stocks and 25% bonds, and then you see all stocks. The data to me are kind of discouraging. I think you would have to take an unacceptable risk to get an acceptable return. 4.8%, you would have to be 100% in stocks, and I think that uh, for most people is uh, really too uh, risky. So how much, uh, how much are you going to need when you retire? Uh, that's the, the important factor. I estimate that the average retired household headed by someone 65 to 74 years old will have expenses about $40,000 a year. This comes from a 2007 Stats Canada reporter report that I extrapolated to current dollar. About 80% was spent on essentials and the rest on lifestyle items. So this study suggests that about a 50% replacement rate may be okay for retirement. That's assuming that you have no huge debts, no mortgages, etc. So now this dollars you're going to have to come up with, about half of it's going to come from the government in the form of CPP and OAS. What about the remaining 20,000? You're going to have to come up with that yourself through other pensions or your savings. Traditional law says that we will need about 500,000 saved up so that we can withdraw 4%, which is 20,000 per year comfortably. That's the 4% rule. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. We're gonna see if that 4% rule is going to uh, hold in this particular situation. And we're gonna do that by running some what we call Monte Carlo uh, simulations. We're gonna make the usual assumptions about CPP and OAS, and uh, we're going to uh, do this as a year for 25 years. Yes, 25 years. People are living longer now. People are retiring early now. Uh, so we have to do that. 25 years. This is an, uh, this Monte Carlo simulation is an interesting thing. You'll get the reference for this um, in the packet that we send to you. So what they do is the computer runs 118 cycles based on every starting point since 1871 and it's adjusted for inflation. So you take a look down there at the bottom, you see the red line, it says zero line. And of those 118 cycles, only two drop below the zero line. So that means we succeeded with 116 out of 118, which gives us a 98.3% success rate. And we have an average final value at the end of 25 years of about $856,000. Well, that sounds pretty good. I could, we could probably do with something maybe a little less uh, successful than that. Let's try the next one. So in the previous slide, we started with 500,000. Now we're going to start with 400,000. So you'll see down at the bottom that about 23 of those lines went through the zero point. That means we ran out of money. So our success rate is about 80.5%. Uh, that might be a little low. The average final value is about 450,000. So starting with not 400,000 or not 500,000, but 450,000 might work. But the question is, how do we get that 450,000? Well, we're going to uh, make some assumptions and do a trial run. Uh, our test subject is 45 years old. He's going to retire when he or she is 65, uh, leaving him uh, 20 years of accumulation time. He's 45 now. He's got till 65 before he retires. He's already saved 250,000 in a registered program that can be invested. If we do a compound annual growth rate calculation, it shows that he needs to achieve a rate of 3% real and a 5% nominal to reach his goal. He's got to take this 250, I make it 450. So according to that previous table from the Howe Institute, we should be able to do that with percent equity, 40% fixed. 
uh, plan. Okay, now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a uh, we're going to make a plan. Everybody needs a good investment plan. It doesn't have to be wordy. A few paragraphs is all you really need, but it really should be written down so that you can refer to it later. If you don't write it down, you tend to uh, remember it the way you want to remember it. So you want to write the thing down. And this is where you start. This is where I am today. This is how much I have. Uh, then this is where I need to be by a certain date. Uh, in 20 years, I have to have $450,000. And this is how I'm going to get there. Well, most of you folks that have read about uh, some of the work I've uh, published in the money say, know that I'm an income investor. So in this case, it shouldn't surprise you that I'm going to set up uh, an income portfolio. So we're going to design the portfolio to meet our needs. You should know by now from your plan how much you have, how much you need, where it's coming from. It doesn't matter that your friends or your neighbors or relatives or whatever make 20% on some small cap stock. If you only need 5%, if you can get it with boring dividend stocks, then go ahead and do that. Investing is not a competition. Leave the bragging rights to others. You shouldn't take any more risk than is needed to achieve your goal. And learning risk management is really... You'll start with the fixed income part. So we're going to have 40% of our income as a, of our portfolio as a fixed income component. I would use a simple GIC letter. There's no need to get fancy. I really subscribe to the uh, KISS principle. And I'm sure you know what that is. Keep it simple. Bonds have the lowest returns, so I have them in your portfolio at all. The primary purpose of bonds in a portfolio was capital preservation, not income. Bonds are like a boat trailing its anchor. It goes slower, but it is safer if the boat gets into shallow or stormy water. Bonds add stability and prevent portfolio wrecks. Some investors count pensions as part of their fixed income portfolio. You can do that if you want. It's up to you. A bond ladder is a portfolio of fixed income securities in which each security has a significantly different maturity date, usually uh, a year different. The purpose of purchasing several smaller bonds with different maturity dates rather than one large bond with a single maturity date is to minimize interest rate risk because as you know now interest rates are very low. They'll probably be hitting up sometime. It also increases your liquidity. 